So when we think about the overall treatment goals, I think all of us similarly want our patients to have no disability and have normal quality of life. That is something we all agree on. The question is, are the treatments that are out there now, are they good enough to actually change the natural history of the disease and also limit disability and improve quality of life? I think when uh, the first anti-TNF therapy, infliximab, was first brought to our, our world in 1998 for Crohn's disease, uh, there was a lot of excitement around the idea that we finally have a drug that targets the biology of Crohn's. The drugs we were using before were somewhat anti-inflammatory or mass lymphocyte proliferation inhibition with thiopurines, uh, which was our classic kind of story from 1980 until the TNF boom in 1998. And at first, the way that this drug came to market was, did it actually make a patient feel better? There was no discussion, does it actually heal the lining? There was a picture on the front of our journal, Gastroenterology, which showed a before and after shot. Uh, we're not used to seeing before and after shots on a, on a medical journal, but it was that dramatic to say you took someone with deep ulcerations and normalized their mucosa. That, to me, finally has caught on now because we're now saying that our therapies need to achieve mucosal healing. Why? Because it will implicate on its ability to reduce the endpoint, which we all want patients and physicians, which is the disability and quality of life. So when our first anti-TNF infliximab, and then in 2007, we had adalimumab approved for Crohn's disease, and then in 2008, we had sertilizumab approved for Crohn's disease. So we had kind of a, there's three of them being used specifically for Crohn's and approved for Crohn's disease. There are others also approved for ulcerative colitis in addition. But if we focus purely on Crohn's disease, we know that we've had almost 20 years of experience with infliximab. We have a decade of experience with adalimumab and almost a decade with sertilizumab. And we know for a fact that if used early enough, meaning not when bowel wall damage has already occurred, kind of circling back to the discussions we've had so far, not waiting for a complication, these drugs work so well at getting the outcome of mucosal healing. We know that our goal is to induce remission and then maintain remission. And so we figured out that we can't induce or maintain remission in someone who already has bowel wall damage that has passed the point of no return. So probably one of the most important things that goes along with TNF use is you need to use it early. We've seen that in cohort studies, some people would say TNF hasn't changed the natural history. That's because the average time to first see a TNF was like five, seven years into disease. Too late. The action is up front. So the question on how to best use anti-TNF therapy with a particular emphasis on monotherapy versus combination therapy, it kind of gives you this historical of the pendulum of IBD and us switching kind of our minds and our guidance. And so I think um, our people who listen to us at, at meetings or in scenarios like this kind of can't keep up with how much we kind of swing from mono to combo back to combo and mono. So if we start from the beginning, at the, um, when these drugs were first approved, they were approved on the background of failing conventional therapy, which meant thiopurines. And that's what we'll talk mainly on when it comes to combination. Methotrexate is another option, but that came into our story a little bit later. We followed the rheumatoid docs a little bit later when we started having issues of combination therapy of an anti-TNF with thiopurine, such as 6-MP or azathioprine. And in 2006, there was the first cases of something called hepatosplenic T-cell lymphoma, which was essentially universally fatal, typically adolescent males. It was the first six cases in 2006. Oddly enough, it was basically the same month that infliximab was approved for pediatric patients, despite these first six cases. Because there was no denying that anti-TNF therapy works extremely well in pediatrics as well as adults. If anything in peds, it may work a little better because the disease duration is shorter, which speaks to the fact if you use it earlier, you get better outcomes. So the discussions at that time were you went from use it together to, oh, maybe you should use infliximab without thiopurines. The fear was that people were gonna develop antibodies against the TNF because the thought process was that the immunomodulator was protecting 
the body from rejecting or developing an antibody to the TNF. Then this fear of combination therapy happened. People thought it mainly affected adolescent or below, so the adult practice didn't change as much as the pediatric practice, maybe. Two years after that, there was a publication called the Sonic uh, Study that said combination therapy is better than monotherapy. So people went, oh no, do I now really need to go back to combination therapy? And if I am, I'll use maybe methotrexate instead of thiopurines because the RA folks weren't seeing this type of malignancy. And then came the understanding of therapeutic drug monitoring, which we then understood that maybe it has nothing to do with two drugs is better than one or that the thiopurine or methotrexate is protecting antibodies, maybe what it's doing is it's giving you enough drug level and it's increasing the actual drug concentration, which will then um, decrease the amount of antibodies to the drug. So what we figured out just recently, there was now update on the whole Sonic story, is that in the end, it didn't matter whether you were on combination or not, you just needed a good drug level to protect yourself against antibodies. So I think now we're understanding that if we do kind of very um, tight control of the drug monitoring, you can use monotherapy. So I'd call that optimized monotherapy versus using combination therapy, but just knowing the risk factors that come along with it. We just recently published a public uh, in the gastroenterology journal on the DEVELOP registry, which is a large pediatric, over 5,000 children followed, um, and 2,500 were on infliximab or anti-TNF, and 2,500 never exposed. And we actually showed that the risk of malignancy, which is what we're really focused on, was not increased in children on Remicade, or sorry, on, the risk was not increased on children, in children with infliximab monotherapy but yes, when used in combination, or even thiopurines alone. So in the pediatric age group where there is that higher risk, um, we're advising that you use optimized monotherapy or substitute thiopurines and stop using thiopurines in pediatric patients.